Today I want to talk about a film that I could just watch and rewatch and analyze for ages. It's called Dead Man, a 1995 film written and directed by Jim Jarmusch, and how it is a story of transitions in many senses. If you are familiar with older Jim Jarmusch films like Permanent Vacation or Stranger Than Paradise, or more recently, a film like Patterson, you know that he tends to make movies that focus on small, slow-moving moments. Moments like the car ride from one scene to another that other movies would normally cut out. He seems interested in transitions and the fibers that construct our lives. Dead Man is like this, but taken to a different level with the historical western aspect and the literary allusion to William Blake, the well-known romantic poet, and Jarmusch actually names the protagonist after this poet and makes him important to the central theme of the story. So, let's take a look. In a general way, the story can be seen as a long, stretched-out journey of one man's death. Blake's journey into the town of Machine is his attempt to assimilate into a culture he does not really belong to or understand. When Blake is laughed out of Dickinson's office, where he hoped to get a job, he has to accept that the identity he foresaw for himself, foresaw ever since his parents passed away and his fiancée left him, will never be fulfilled. He suffers a kind of social death at this point because the polite respect that he so values as having for fellow human beings does not seem to exist in Machine at all. The name of the town can be seen as symbolic of the energy of it. Borrowing terminology from the Industrial Revolution that was sweeping the world, it suggests a fuel-eating monster that takes anything in smaller than it and brutally transforms it. William Blake being sucked into machine is evident in the scenes in which he gets lost in Mr. Dickinson's factory. Even the images of the train's locomotive earlier are used to show the extreme, unstoppable energy associated with the time of the expansion of settlers in America. William Blake is forced to deal with his own mortality in the film. He is in a position of in-betweens, between life and death, but he also is in between social groups. He is white, but he sides with natives by traveling with one. A character named Nobody takes the role of William Blake's guide throughout his journey, but he gives limited guidance. He really gestures towards a sort of mindset for Blake to foster, but he does so with cryptic sayings and quoted lines from the poet William Blake, who he is convinced is reincarnated in William Blake the character. This style that the poet himself fashions in his poetry does not allow for a certified path to be dictated, but rather allows for Blake to find himself by letting go of previously perceived restrictions and concerns. Nobody generally takes up the visionary thinking of the poet William Blake and tries to push it on the character, as if to wake up the memories he thinks he should have of writing the poems. Nobody's suggestions to Blake about his glasses in which he says, perhaps you will see clearer without them, mimics the poet's famous lines from The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up, till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Nobody's point in his nebulous comment is that there is no continuum of correctness in vision. Every perception is valid, and in fact, a change in perception could be enlightening. A closed-minded vision of the world can be devastating, especially if it is stable and unchanging. 
Blake's title as a dead man relates to his status as an emissary between our world and the world beyond, or some kind of connection between all periods of time. He is so close to death, and this seems to be what attracts nobody to him throughout his journey. There is also a connection to shamanism in the movie, as nobody also ingests peyote in one scene. Historically, peyote was taken for its use of sacred visions, and the shamans who used it were interceptors between this world and something larger. Nobody's attachment to William Blake seems to mirror his desire to explore other realms through the use of this drug. Jim Jarmusch also points to this idea of a dying man's journey through Henri Michoud's quote used as an introduction to the movie, it is preferable not to travel with a dead man. While the visions a shaman tells of can be of value to others, and many cultures believe that a dying man is close to some form of truth, only few are willing to actually perform the mission of either. Nobody's name can be directly connected to this opening quote because he is the one, since nobody can join one on a journey to death, who travels with Blake and shares in his existential pondering. There is an emphasis on the finality of Blake's journey and transformation. It is because of this apparent finality that others fear his position, and nobody seems interested in his journey because he understands the necessity of his death as part of the cyclical nature of life. Besides opening his senses to perceptions outside his usual scope, Blake becomes more violent as the movie continues. The audience can note an extreme change in the character's demeanor as the film goes on. He learns to kill with an expressionless face and even takes a bullet in his arm without a hint of the panic he earlier exhibited. He does not just put himself in the position of defensive running, killing only when a gun is pointed at him first, but he actually walks into a trading post knowing that he will most likely be recognized. He becomes a calm killer, openly admitting that he is the murderer everyone is looking for. He combats the violent machine that the men of the white world have become. It can hardly be said, however, that Blake is fighting for the Native Americans. Their genocide is something he observes and has sympathy for, but he does not even understand them enough to defend them. His relationship to them seems similar to the one he has with the dead fawn he lays down next to in one scene. He feels for its innocence and perhaps can relate to its treatment in the harsh country, but he can do nothing to help it. America's status in the film is depicted as in a period of transition. Dead Man grapples with an imagined past that is so violent its audience of modern Americans may be disgusted with their own history. By telling a brutal story of the formation of America in 1995, the present is automatically connected to the past and a strange looking backwards takes place. The classic westerns were, in many instances, meant to energize a feeling of nationalism within its audience, while in contrast, this film portrays a founding of a country by killing all obstacles in sight. Instead of glorifying a country's beginnings, Jarmusch forces the questions, how do you live in a culture that has genocide in its past? How do you follow such violence? The forces at play in this point of history are clearly differentiated as the Native Americans and the white settlers. If the violence of expanding a country is necessary, the viewers of this film must reckon with images of upturned canoes, burning skeletons of Native Americans, and tattered teepees, in addition to the fact that over a million buffalo had been killed in just one year, according to the film. The way the men on the train from the opening scene jump to shoot the buffalo suggests that they are casually knowledgeable of their duty to kill. Such a duty is what raised the country up after destroying what was already there. In his visionary writings, William Blake also thinks about the sequence of historical events and how one kind of energy can follow another. In the same passage in which the poet William Blake comments on man's doors of perception, he also has a few lines prophesizing. The ancient tradition that the world will be consumed in fire at the end of six thousand years is true, as I have heard from hell. Blake's detail that he heard this prophecy from hell demonstrates that Blake views hell as a necessary part of our cosmology. This theme is many times referred to in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. He pours his lines through Proverbs of Hell in order to combat the lack of balance in people's perception of hell versus heaven. By trying to do so, he seems to think that a dichotomy of the two is unhelpful because both stages are necessary parts of the flow of life.
the idea of hell or rather a period of ugly suffering and corruption comes up in the movie through the time period it is set in it is difficult to say that jarmusch is not judging such a degree of violence in a civilization but at the same time the audience has to decide why it is necessary for the character william blake to change himself to match the violence of his surroundings instead of just phasing out an innocent among corrupt <laughs> of hell. You already asked. The film, being a modern take on America's own violent past, treats time in a way that forces the audience to consider history and what the transitional period, so steeped in violence, means for our current standpoint. In order to complete his journey, Blake must cross the bridge made of waters to reach where the sea meets the sky. The choice of language here, in a style trying to capture the wisdom of native religion, combines the essential ideas of transition, cycles, and reflection. The final moments of the movie switch between shots of Blake's face, distorted with terror at his own death as his eyes begin to close, and a view of the sky. Jarmusch's camera work here puts forth a suggestion that the conclusion of Blake's mortality is related to the setting of the sun and natural images of earth. The last fade-out, then, ending with a glint of light from the sun reaching the edge of water, completes the blackening process and prepares for rebirth. This scene eloquently combines the idea of Blake's own death approaching with the overarching theme of historical transformation, making way for something new to replace what has ended.